I'm so excited to introduce Dr. Pauline Boss to make time to connect today. So Dr. Pauline Boss is a professor emeritus from the University of Minnesota. She is an educator and researcher who is widely recognized for her groundbreaking research on what is now known as the theory of ambiguous loss that she coined in the 1970s. Dr. Boss has been a practicing family therapist for 45 years. Dr. Boss has written a series of books on this very subject and one that I have read and many of you within this community have probably read called Loving Someone Who Has Dementia, which was released in 2011. So Dr. Boss or Pauline, I am so honored that you are coming out of retirement today to speak to us. Um, thank you so much. I'm so happy that you can be here. It's my pleasure, Emma. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. So, you know, this term of ambiguous loss has been brought to my attention repeatedly from um, other care partners and therapists that I have worked with. Um, and I had never heard of it before, but when I learned about it, I was struck by how it defined exactly how I was feeling. Um, and it brought me reassurance that there is like actually a theory behind it and that it is a real feeling and that it made me feel not as alone um, on this journey. You know, can you define ambiguous loss for our viewers? Sure. Ambiguous loss is simply an unclear loss. Um, it's not about death. It's about a person who is physically absent, but psychologically present. Uh, for example, kidnapped children or soldiers missing in action um, and so on. Or it can be the opposite, which is when the person is physically present right there in front of you, but they are psychologically absent due to some illness or condition that causes dementia. Uh, there are over 80 kinds of illnesses and conditions that lead to dementia. So, you know, what I've also come to learn um, through this experience and this type, you know, of loss, people can be very judgmental about this idea or not really understanding what ambiguous loss is. So, you know, God forbid, if I dare speak of grief being felt, um, usually it's met with you know, but this person is still in front of you. Why or how could you be grieving someone that is still alive? You know, can you talk to this point and educate others here? I'll try. <laughs> well, they are thinking about death. And this is not the situation of death. This is a situation where somebody gradually fades away and it's immensely painful and not very well understood by other people unless they've gone through it. And so what you have is a loss that is not definitive. Uh, there's no finality to the loss. It just each day or each week or month, you notice you've lost something new. Um, for example, you can't travel together anymore. And then as time goes on, uh, this person may not even know who you are. Or as time goes on further, they may not even be able to swallow. Uh, so it's a progressive disease with steps that go downward, the opposite of raising a child, where the steps, the cognitive development goes upward. In this case, it goes downward. So it's very hard to find hope and meaning for the caregivers during this time. What I'm trying to do is to give this kind of loss a name so that people don't think they're going crazy because it is a very, very confusing kind of loss with the person still physically present, but psychologically absent. Then there are times when they may come back uh, as if it was the way it used to be, or at least with Alzheimer's disease, and then it confuses people even more. So the grief that comes from this is a frozen grief. It's not like the grief at a funeral with uh, a death certificate and a body to bury. Uh, it's a frozen and confusing grief 
because the person has not died. And yet there is much to grieve. The things you did together, the things, uh, the happy times you had, the, the help you had, the support you had, all of that is gone. Other people need to understand that it's a gradual loss and that it's okay to grieve along the way. And then I think there's also criticism for caregivers who don't grieve enough to suit the onlookers at the funeral, which ultimately comes, but many years later. And that is because they've shed their tears along the way. Mm -hmm. And many of the women and, and men will say to me, I have no tears left, I shed them along the way. So the general public um, must learn more about this. And that's what you're doing, Emma. You're educating the general public about this. And I think it's very, very important. It's an unusual grief. It's an unusual grief. And you know, one that I think that is a different type of grief when you are you have this type of grief of ambiguous loss. But then also there is this, there must be a new type of grief or a different feel of this grief once the person is gone. Yes, and that's a transition that has to be made. Another challenge for caregivers, that is when you're no longer giving care and you now have, um, I don't like to use the word closure at all. We'll talk about that a bit, but when you have a certainty that the person is now gone, transformed to another state, and, and the literature in grief right now says you don't have to get over it. And the five stages are, are not useful because stages imply when you, leave, when you reach the last stage, you're over it. So they give a false hope to people. What you do though is transform the, uh, the presence, the attachment to that person. Perhaps in fact, to honor their memory by working on a cause uh, that took them away. For example, when my little brother died at age 13 of polio, the, the summer before the sock vaccine came out, our whole family went door to door collecting dimes for the March of Dimes. It made us feel better to do something active in honor of Eddie. And so something active would be uh, something that might be helpful. And it could even be just having a memorial to that person or writing a book, which I did, uh, which um, may give you more um, purpose in living without the person you have loved and who is now truly gone. Yeah, that uh, speaks volumes to me. So going back to this idea of frozen grief, how do we deal with that kind of grief? That's a good question. So there are a couple ways you can do it, but one of the tools that I recommend is both and thinking, which is not typical American way of thinking. We like linear thinking and certainty. This is a more dialectical way of thinking, a more Eastern way of thinking. And that is you, you say to yourself, he is both here and also gone which is as close to the truth as you can get. And so you know you have partial things to grieve and also a partial things to say that he's still here. I can still touch him. Uh, and that both end thinking uh, in much of what's going on in your confusing life right now and very challenging life, it's hard work, um, is a useful way to lower your stress. So I'm talking about stress here. The stress of living with ambiguity and ambiguous loss is huge. And so you have to manage the stress level in a way that you can continue even to function. So both and thinking is a useful way. Um, when my husband was um, getting sicker and sicker, uh, he had vascular issues. Uh, he was both here and gone. He was at moments himself and, and also not himself. You know, I was both happy to have him here and 
feeling I was losing myself. Both of those were true because of caregiving. I'm sure you can relate. Yes, I can. You know, I grieve every day about different things being lost in our family's lives. And, you know, there is not a day that goes by where life feels normal to me. I don't even know what normal is and what that looks like anymore. But, you know, with a lot of work, I have sort of come to acceptance of what is, which um, has been very freeing, I think for me, has kind of sort of stabilized me a bit. But I, I have come to this point where it's like, I'm not fighting what is, you know, I'm not in denial about it. I'm just embracing just this journey that we're on. Uh So, you know, my question is, how can one live and dare I say, even thrive with ambiguous loss? I'm not terribly fond of the word acceptance Hmm. um, because it means you have to surrender. This is going to go on a long time for many people. Um, And so you have to stay strong in order to um, bear the journey, in order to bear the ambiguity. I think you're right. I think you need to embrace the ambiguity because it's not going to go away. He's here and he's also not here. Uh, and, And that's really hard for us Westerners to do. Eastern people do it better, but it can be learned. So the both end thinking really helps. Don't let anyone tell you absolutes, that they know he's gone, that he knows he's here, because neither one of those absolutes is correct. It's both and. And also it's terrible and yet something in your life must be wonderful. And I would bet it's the children. And so say those two things together. I have a terrible loss. And I also have a wonderful gain, my kids. Mm -hmm. And he helped give them to you. So you can frame it that way. Mm -hmm. And if you start thinking in in that way, it may lighten the load for you a bit. And it is, frankly, closer to the truth than to say he's gone. Uh, He's partly gone. And so uh, regarding acceptance, I prefer to say I've decided to accept it, which means you have more agency because it was your decision. That's what I'm most concerned about is your decision. Did somebody... um, force you to do it? Or did you, as a human being, decide to accept the, the, Ill, the illness, really, the ambiguity that the illness causes? I just found by fighting what was, I just wasn't moving forward, you know, and, um, and I, you know, we don't have many decisions in this road, you know, so right. I do, I, I, kind of felt like I will decide to accept, right? And I think, like I said, it's just allowed me to not fight the disease, not fight Mm -hmm. what is. And I think that helps give me sort of strength to be able to move myself and our children through um, this journey. That is not- I like how you said that, yes. Caregivers in general have trouble with agency, uh, with their mastery, because you are in effect caught in a situation outside of your control. And most of us, at least in Western cultures, like to be in charge of our own day and of our own destiny, right? And all of a sudden, we aren't. Mm. And so you have to find something you can control in each day, even if it's small. Um, You know, that's why during the pandemic, when people were so out of control with this ambiguous virus that we didn't know anything about, they were baking bread. Did you notice that? 
They're oh, like sure. you're baking bread. And I thought, what a wonderful way to, to get something you can control for a couple hours. Mm -hmm. And it has a very nice outcome. Uh, that was really smart of people. But other people do it other ways, you know, exercising and playing an instrument, doing something. But something where you can control. You need a little bit of that every day, mm -hmm. even if it's small, mm -hmm. to balance the situation you can't control. That's true for all caregivers. Yeah, I'm always one that loves to be in control. And, uh, you know, things are so, it just felt so out of control. Um, you know, we have, you know, we have our plans and ideas of what we want for our future or what we think that looks like. And when things just get turned and twisted, it's just, it's difficult, very difficult. And so another thing to, to think about um, when you feel like this, that everything has been spoiled, is to try to begin to think about some new hope and new purpose. Um, might be regarding your children. You know, what do you hope for them? Um, and what, well, how old are they? Um, so Mabel is 11 and Evelyn is nine. Oh, that's a lovely age. Yeah. So I would balance some new, some thinking about new hope and purpose of you as a single parent eventually mm -hmm. uh, with those girls to balance the sort of place where you have no agency and no hope right now. It's too much to bear for caregivers if you can't balance it with something, some new hope and some meaning of a new purpose eventually. Just play with that. It doesn't need decisions right now, but play with it to balance, to balance the downside. Well, many caregivers ask me if it's gone on for 10 or 20 years, am I still married? Um, and I believe the Alzheimer's Association encourages caregivers to have a social life. You need it to stay healthy. Uh, social contact is an important thing for human beings to stay healthy. But you do again a both and. You both have a social life with other people and you do visit the person who is ill, the person you love who is ill. Uh, you don't just cut them off. So it's again doing both things. Some people visit every day, all day long, for example, to a nursing home. That isn't quite recommended because that means your life is totally that and isolated from social connection, from social support. You want to do it half and half. And that's, that's a way to stay healthy. And I'm going to tell you something that is not good news, but I think it's something caregivers need to know, that caregivers die at a rate 63% higher than their same age group. So caregiving is dangerous to your health. You really do need to balance it with some social contact. And it's hard to do, I know, but if you can arrange help, use the help to free yourself to have some social connections, mm -hmm. some friends, some lunches, some walks, it's, you know, whatever you like. Yeah, it's so important to make time for ourselves um, because I feel like when we don't, just everything, you know, when you are sort of running the ship, and that's sort of been a balancing act for me, just learning how to sort of balance both it's just so heavy. it is heavy isn't it's it? so heavy but my point is is that it is so important to find that balance to be able so that you can be the best care partner that you can be you know when you're burning the candle at both ends like no one wins so but you need help um we all do i had professional help a caregiving team from eight in the morning until three in the afternoon and then I, it was me, but toward the end, I, I was going to hire them 24 seven, but it still would have been me who organizes the team uh, and also hands-on caring for my husband as well. So you want to use all the help you can get 
And sometimes even the help would be organizational to give you a moment off uh, or to take a vacation. Maybe you should take a short vacation now and then. You and the girls just go away to the beach or something um, because it's for the sake of your health. And the caregiver must take care of his or own health. And it's a very hard thing to do because it seems selfish. It is not selfish. It is what allows you to continue caregiving. Yeah, that is so powerful. Thank you for sharing that. So I just want to remind our viewers that, you know, one of my favorite books that you have written is called Loving Someone Who Has Dementia. Um, I'm going to link it below. This book has been so helpful. It's a book that I pick up every now and again and just sort of read a paragraph, a page. Um, but I, I can't recommend that book enough. Um, can you also talk about the University of Minnesota's ambiguous loss professorship. Oh, thank you for bringing that up. Um, well, Emma, I confess I'm 89 years old uh, and I can't keep teaching about ambiguous loss and we need to have the concept continue and the research and teaching continue. So the University of Minnesota um, has an ambiguous loss fund uh, to build a professorship so they can continue the teaching and research. And the fund number is 7645. And donations are welcome uh, to help that fund grow so that the teaching can continue. I would love to continue, but I, I need to face reality. Uh, and that is at 89, um, there has to be someone else who can do that. And that's in the department of what is called family social science in the College of Education and Human Development at the University of Minnesota. Um, it is certainly a social psychological idea, ambiguous loss. And so it is in that department, but it's also called family psychology, family psychoeducation, family therapy, and in this department, we had the doctoral program and family therapy. Having an illness with, that causes dementia affects the whole family, as you well know. Pauline, your work has been so impactful um, for me and so many people. Thank you for your service for all these years. You have really helped so many people. Um, so thank you for that. Thank you for saying that, Emma. And take care. You're doing a good job educating the public. Keep it up. Thank you. So I love ending these conversations with hope. Um, can you leave us with some hope today? As a, a researcher practitioner, my hope frequently lies with science. And I'm hoping that science continues to find answers for us, especially regarding dementia. My other hope, of course, is that caregivers are getting, well, let me say it, smarter, primarily because they're talking to each other. Uh, there are online caregiving units if you can't go to one in person. Um, and uh, they're beginning to know that human contact is the um, help for being um, alone with a patient who has uh, some kind of dementia, and they have hope in finding each other in social support, in community support. You cannot do this walk alone. So the hope lies in finding other people. And I think, in fact, um, that can get us through a lot of hard times. I'm very hopeful about people like you, Emma. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pauline. Thank you for taking the time and making time to connect with me. I greatly appreciate it.